the areas that I think is really different for me in working in this sector that I haven't experienced before is then say, how do I make sure that I've got that really close tie in with our legal team and the public policy teams to be able to make sure that everything that we do is within the remit of what Ofcom is legally allowed to do. Richard, it's great to have you on the show. It's great to be here. So you are the Chief Data Officer at the UK Office of Communications within the UK, or Ofcom for short. So maybe to set the stage, walk us through Ofcom's mission, and more importantly, what does data mean for Ofcom? Yeah, so Ofcom, uh, as you said, the uh, Office for Communications, uh, is a converged regulator uh, for all communications within the UK. Uh, it has a mission to make communications work for everyone uh, around the UK, um, and that covers everything from public sector broadcast, so TV, radio, the radio waves, so spectrum, the licensing, um, the operation around that, um, and then look at networks and communications, so the resilience of the communication networks, but then telco, broadband, mobile, um, as an economics regulator on that side. And then more recently, uh, look at we're setting ourselves up as the regulator for online safety. Uh, so where's data in that? Uh, well, data is really at the heart of everything we do at Ofcom. We pride ourselves in being um, a evidence-based uh, policy regulator. Um, so the way that we look at this is to say, how can the data teams uh, support the regulatory decision-making for policy, for licensing, by putting the data and information in the hands of those that are making uh, the decisions? Preparing for this interview is actually pretty challenging because there's so many things that we can cover in our chat, right? One of them is the Absolutely. use cases that you've been unlocking at Ofcom. But what I wanted to focus on in today's conversation is how you've been approaching the data strategy at Ofcom and some of the use cases data unlocks within government. Uh, so maybe to start us off, walk us through the key components of the data strategy at Ofcom. Yeah, so we have been... Uh creating a new data strategy uh, for Ofcom as we go forward. Um, I, I'll test our mission statement with you and see what you think. So currently, we've, we're aligning to good data, good people, good decisions. How's that sound? Sounds great. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> in terms of what that means, so on the uh, people side, it's really about how we set up the culture on uh, the good data. It's about making sure that we've got excellent data in the hands of people that need it. Um, and then on the decision side, that's about making sure that we've got the data platforms that are able to create that self-serve capability. But then from the delivery side, making sure that everyone's speaking the same language when it comes to data. That's really great. And I love, you know, the use of the term good people, good data, good decisions. I think it's really important to kind of create a, a engaging communication strategy about a, a, a organization's data strategy. And we'll discuss that a bit more detail. But let's maybe roll back slightly to the beginning. You know, you've been at Ofcom for the past eight to nine months, I think, at the time of the recording. Uh, as a chief data officer looking to build a data strategy for an organization like Ofcom, walk us through the first two months on the job. What do you think constitutes a, first, a successful first two months and what are common pitfalls to expect? Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so I started in the uh, first couple of months with these grand ambitions of what I wanted to do and how uh, you know we'd get this uh, business unit set up and we'd be delivering. Um, and you know, as you go into uh, a new role, you write yourself some OKRs. You're like, this is what I want to do. But honestly, in the first two months, I was still talking to people and getting to know the business. Um, and this is something that I think I've learned that it takes a lot longer, especially with a business the size of Ofcom, or with certainly with the remit that it has, trying to understand all of those different areas takes a lot of work. So we've been going for 20 years, the Data Innovation Hub, the central team was set up in 2019. Um, they've delivered a huge number of products uh, that are then being delivered into all of the different areas of the business. 
And a large part of it was trying to understand, well, how is the processes working? Um, where are where is it working? Where is it not working? What are the main key challenges that the business has uh, that a data team can add value to? And how do I enable those teams to use data more effectively? Um, that said, I think from those conversations, it was quite quick. To, I was quite quick to see that certain things were missing. And uh, so within the first two months, I was really setting ourselves up for success for the future. So uh, key things, there wasn't a data strategy. So people didn't have a vision for the value that data could give or how they would look to use data uh, and how we could bring the community of data professionals together to understand and how they could grow their careers within Ofcom. Um, beyond that is then looking at how do we make sure that we've got the data uh, dictionary, the asset registry. So there wasn't one person who knew all of the data across the organization. And another key thing for me, which helped to define the data strategy, we do governance really well uh, within Ofcom, uh, but it's sometimes done a little too well uh, and there's a bit of duplication in the process to just cover the gaps and it's done in multiple teams in slightly different ways so it wasn't a full end-to-end -end thing and that's not me saying that things will fall down through the gaps it's more saying that it just wasn't efficient and so people were spending more time on doing the governance than they were on the delivery and so really keen to say how do I make let data people do the things that they can do by having a more efficient governance process. I definitely don't envy the chief data officer's role, especially going into a new organization, trying to understand the lay of the land. Uh, but maybe as a mental model for you, as you approach these transformational projects and setting up a data strategy, what would be your advice for data leaders looking to get a quick win, for example, after they learn um, the lay of the land within the organization within the first two, three months? What do you think is um, a good framework for trying to understand what is a quick win within the organization? Yes, I think this is where, for me, it's understanding where the pain points are. So those conversations I was having, I was talking to people um, across all the different business areas, and you start to see common uh, areas where they're not getting the data, they're not getting the information they need in the most efficient way or in a way that enables people across the business to use information as effectively as they can. Um so for me, a quick win was really to come in and uh, start to understand where some of those opportunities were. To be able to understand that, I think, is really about understanding uh, some of the value drivers uh, that you have in a business and then working through how you can record or measure those uh, to be able to have effective prioritization. And you mentioned part of the data strategy, really the key components of the data strategy at Ofcom is good people, good data, good decisions, right? So Absolutely. let's maybe work back. Let's work back from these uh, from these components and kind of tease them out one by one, right? I want to start off with the data. Um, you mentioned as well the importance of understanding the value drivers of data, trying to align data with organizational value. Um, walk us through the component of data. What does good data look like? What are the standards that you look to set within your organization as a data leader? Yes, I think um, understanding the value of data is really important. So I, I, uh, this is probably something within uh, a regulator that's a bit more difficult compared to where I was before. So I used to work in a bank and uh, you could look at data, the value from data as they're saying, are we increasing the revenue? Are we looking at cost reduction? Um, is there an efficiency saving? Is there a risk mitigation? And all of those can be translated into a pound amount. Um, suddenly working in uh, an arm's length body, those drivers aren't there anymore. Uh, or not to the same extent. We have cost reduction and efficiency, certainly. And we've got a uh, uh, cash flat budget. So we've got to make some of those efficiencies to be able to do more. But we've then got to make more conscious decisions on how we measure the value of data. And really, as part of that good data, it's about how we uh, start to understand where we can uh, drive some of those. So absolutely still looking at the cost and the efficiency savings. But a large part is also saying, how do we enable teams to use data more effectively? So looking at where the alignment is with the uh, data, the analytics, the decision-making process to our three-year plan, to some of the operations that we have. Uh, we've consciously across the organization made uh, choices of things we're leaning into and things we're leaning out of. 
uh, interestingly, data helps both of those. So if there's something that a uh, part of the organization, so for example, the Spectrum team is saying, actually, we're going to lean out of that as a conscious choice, but it's still some of the BAU activity, the business as usual activity that they have to do. We have to then say, well, how can data support that, whether it's a data automation, a pipeline, getting that engineering uh, done, or is there a way to have a uh, reproducible analytical pipeline that's able to uh, get the information, the insights to people in a more efficient way, uh, effectively, so that they can lean out of that piece of work that they were doing, uh, or certainly reduce the amount of effort that it takes, and then be able to have that capability to lean into some of the key business areas uh, that they'll be looking at as part of their three-year plan. And I think trying to measure those as a value is really key to being able to help prioritize the activity. Um, beyond that, I think we can talk about the uh, advantages and the future technology that data giving. But the, as data, the technology is changing, that means that we can have more capability that we can give to people. I think some of this goes back to what I'd almost term as resilience. So, whereas something would have needed some a team of people and uh, with years of coding experience with some of the no code low code environments we're able to now offer tools that will enable people to move faster and potentially improve the resilience of the organization as a whole um, and that's a key part of some of the value drivers that we're looking at as well that's awesome and you know there's a lot of things that i would like to kind of tease out from your um from your answer here you mentioned kind of the data engineering part building the data pipeline making sure that data is reproducible what are some of the challenges associated with that when you know revamping or improving the data infrastructure in a government agency such as ofcom so um, i think i mentioned before ofcom is now entering its 20th year so it's our birthday uh this year big anniversary uh and it was set up from a number of different regulated areas and we're uh, empowered by acts of parliament and those come to us to be able to regulate different uh, sectors of the communications uh, landscape. As that's happened, there's uh, been these things are coming in, they're being set up and they're set up in a siloed way. Those will all have their own systems, their own stores of data, their own methodologies for how they look to produce insights and use those in decisions. Um, and so a key part of that data engineering plank that we're looking at is so how do we actually start to use the platforms more effectively to create a single data store uh, where we have that information we're able to then look across uh, the full gamut of data that we have available where it's being collected in a way that it is able to be used in a manner so we can start to say where's the converged consumer so how are people using telecoms broadband uh, mobile how does that impact their online safety and like is there methods where we can start to understand some of that convergence of the consumer across all of those different uh, areas of uh the regulations that we have but to facilitate that is uh part of the i mentioned the data excellence banner of our um data strategy we need to have really strong uh metadata that's able to support that um, and this is where we're trying to build up some of that information so we can say where's the data and being able to just have a really good searchable store of data, understanding the lineage that the data has been taken through. So what transformations have been made on data? Who's the owners at different stages of that data? If we have raw data that we've ingested for a very specific purpose, from our legal remit, we can only use that data for that purpose. So we need to maintain the metadata as that data is aggregated and goes through different stages of reporting so that the final reports and the insights maintain that level of security, confidentiality, and purpose throughout so we can't then misuse data. And that's really key to how we're setting ourselves up. So we're maintaining that full governance, but also enabling people to move faster by using uh, uh, the metadata around it to be able to support people. That's really great. And you mentioned as well in your answer, like the importance of understanding the value drivers of data and aligning data with the business value. Uh, I think this is probably one of the biggest pitfalls data teams face when getting started with data. Um, walk us through maybe why that pitfall is so common. Uh, because a lot of the times you see data teams, especially early in their uh, journey, kind of approach really 
complex use cases that don't necessarily unlock business value, uh, but are just really cool to have. And what do you think as a data leader, uh, are mental models data leaders can adopt to avoid this pitfall? Um, yeah, so <laughs> I, I've seen this a num- like throughout my history, and I've probably been guilty of it myself. Like you get excited about a new technology, and you're like, I want to see what what what's what's the potential of this. And before you know it, you yeah, <laughs> God, the number of, <laughs> I, the number of times. So when I was in the bank, I don't see it so much now, but it's certainly there. Someone would go to a conference, a senior leader, and they're like, "Ah, oh, I want uh, this machine learning." And like, okay, what do you want to do with the machine learning? So don't argue with me. I want machine learning. <laughs> like, okay, fine. <laughs> Artificial intelligence that's needed. Um, and we're probably going to see this now with people saying, "I want a large language model. Give me Chat GPT in my business." And you're like, okay, what do you actually want? What's the business problem? And I think, like, I've seen this, like, with some of the data teams and uh, people get into a, this is something that I'm interested in. People go and they spend years doing, like, research, PhDs, they're, like, constantly learning. And I want to encourage that because it's great because the more that people go and they learn something new, that might be applicable to what we need we might need in the future so having that capability and the uh, curiosity should never be discouraged at the same time part of the process of being like that data leader is to say how to have strong business partnering uh, and this is part of the process that we're looking to set up is to say how do we go into the businesses understand their problems and un- treat the So we're a cross-functional team. How do we treat those regulatory teams, the people who are making policy decisions, enforcement decisions, the operational decisions? How do we understand where their pain points are or really understand what they're looking to do and then suggest methods so the technology and the data can be used to do that? And sometimes, like, we could be using some of the, like, really cool advanced techniques. Uh, Other times, we just have to rein it in. But it's a trying to keep that balance we're saying i want to maintain the curiosity and keep people alive and interested in the subject and potentially then finding routes to be able to deliver on those but in a way that adds value to the business i completely agree and you know i think it's a lot of times as well a lot of the value drivers that you see within data within an organization uh, come from descriptive analytics and diagnostic analytics and not necessarily a lot from complex machine learning models right and being able to align that and create that partnership between the business functions as well as the data functions is extremely important to keep that alignment of value but i do agree that sometimes uh, you know uh, machine learning is very cool it's uh, it's uh, and large stuff like large language models and chat GPT are very interesting and they tend to create a lot of um, they tend to attract especially technically minded folks because uh, of how interesting of a problem set it creates right for you to solve so let's talk about the data culture component of uh, your data strategy right you mentioned here we talked about good good data let's talk about good people and good decisions right and what does that mean um so you mentioned here the cultural change aspect of Ofcom's data strategy. This is probably the most important and most challenging aspect of a data strategy. Uh, walk us through why it's so important and what does cultural change look like at Ofcom? Absolutely. It's the, what a culture, I think, is quite often one of those the hardest pieces to change. It's a m- more ingrained and... Um, Luckily, I think Ofcom's in a really good position. Like one of my take homes, uh, you asked about my first two months. Uh, the first week I came home and I'm like, wow, there's some really, really smart people that are here. Uh, it's attracted these a great range of technical experts and people who are curious. So part of that cultural piece is a lot easier to fix in terms of saying, how do we move into more data driven area? Um, so our strategy for data looks in, I say, two main dimensions. So the first is saying from that kind of cross area, how do we support data literacy? So this is somewhere where we want to try to help people from across all of the business, everyone within Ofcom, understand what data is, what the uh, methodologies look like, uh, what the tools are that they could be using. So if they're hearing about, I don't know, some kind of uh, data lake, a data lake house, or wherever it would be, how do they start to know what these terms are and be able to 
have that conversation with more technical people. Um, beyond that, we're also like, these are people that are going to be giving insights and they're going to have statistics and we want to be able to get them questioning those statistics and understanding where they come from. So, you know, it's kind of like how, how, do, how to lie with statistics in reverse. It's like how, how do you spot that? Uh, the people that might have given you information that are trying to hide something through the gaps and trying to work through that within that data literacy bracket. Um, Interestingly, we've just had our chief legal counsel and a number of his team of uh, lawyers going through this. And uh, that's been absolutely brilliant because we work really closely with the lawyers in terms of what's within our remit, what data are we allowed to use. So having them being trained on how data could be used has been really important for us and certainly not a traditional area that you'd usually say, train the lawyers on how to use data. Um, but it's been great to see that. And then beyond that, you've got the in-depth technical experts. So this is where we have our data profession. And currently, we've got an organization which has been set up with um, people who have a line manager who might not be a data expert. So they're having their career development conversations from someone who's not a data expert. And so we're trying to say we've got this big, wide community of data people. How do we make sure that every single person in that community is supported in their future career development? So trying to understand what their specific skill set is. So are they a data scientist? Are they a data engineer? Are they a machine learning expert? Uh, and trying to work through at different levels what skills and capabilities that they need and then linking where there might be gaps in their skill set to specific learning courses where that's a internal learning a web design learning or potentially professional uh, certification and helping people to build their career so they can reach their full potential at the positions they're in or as they're looking aspirationally to move to another area of data uh, delivery or if they're looking to progress their career how can they start to build up those skills and apply them within Ofcom so that's really key to what we're doing. I want to tease out a few things as well you mentioned here. Um, I want to focus on this career development side of things for data scientists and data uh, and data practitioners. We will talk about the data literacy side of things uh, shortly. Um, but, you know, data science, I think, has a problem, uh, which is that career development is not necessarily as codified uh, within, data, within data science as you see in other technical professions like software engineers, right? Um, if someone joins a data scientist position right now at most companies, right, unless you're a Google or a Meta or a Amazon, right, there's no data science, data scientist level one, level two, level three, staff data scientists, et cetera. Um, it's really dependent on what the value that you bring in as a data professional, right? And the organization needs to, on an ad hoc basis, adapt that. I wonder how you view that perspective, right? Um, what do you think are ways organizations can um, codify the career development and the uh, laddering of a data scientist within within their teams? Yes, yeah, so I, I, was, I was almost going to challenge that. I think um, organizations could. I may, if they haven't, it's either a lack of a conscious decision to have done that. And I think this is very key to what we're doing is to have that laddering approach so you can start to say, is someone entry level so we we have a talent development pipeline that we're looking at so how we gain people in where they're grads and we have interns that are coming in and we're looking at a diverse network of people to be able to support that so whether that's women in days so of the bright network for some of the internship to be able to support the diversity that we have but as we grow through that, that's kind of like entry level. So we're saying for the apprentices, how do we get them onto an apprenticeship program so they actually then have that full career development? We're then looking at uh, even internally taking people who might not have data science skills, for example, or data engineering, and working with them to do internal uh, apprenticeships uh, at a higher level so they can build their career journey and cross-functionally train. Um, but then 
even as people roll off from the grad program, they got the associates, senior associates, the principals, each of those stages, we're looking to say, how do we make sure that they've got some of the skills that we need? That's both a technical skills, but also then looking at some of the wider leadership and uh, capability skills that we would expect people to have at different stages of that. So I don't know, the business partnering, the value assessment, uh, all of those kind of things that you start to have where you do more senior work as well as more uh in-depth capability uh, build that we have um so yeah we do have the laddering and we're starting to make that work by saying what skills we're expecting to see from people at different parts there um one of the key distinctions that we're also looking to set up is the difference between what's a technical expert and a people manager and i think sometimes that's over like looked because you kind of say oh if you progress your career then you've got to now become a people manager and not do any of the technical stuff that you got into the job because you loved uh, so how do we start to enable people to grow in their careers from a technical leadership point of view and a thought leadership within that space and really encourage them to do that. But then enabling people who are more of the people people and like <laughs> being able to develop and coach team members to be able to do that effectively. And I think they're different skills that people might have different capabilities on. So, some you can teach and some more of a um, desire to be able to do that. I love that. And I love how you've approached kind of lettering as well, you know, from a people manager perspective versus like a distinguished data scientist, right? Like creating a technical track, but also a people management track. Um, you know, let's talk now about data literacy and data culture and more general, right? Uh, in a lot of ways, you mentioned that the data culture at Ofcom is, um, is powered by data literacy. You want to be able to kind of scale data literacy within the organization. What does data literacy at Ofcom look like in context of day-to-day -day operations? There's, yeah, there's a number of different areas we can look at for that. So um, part of it is we're an evidence-based regulator. So for us to be able to make decisions, to make an enforcement action, to be able to have effective supervisory relationships, we need to be able to say, how do we, how do those people are able to assess the information that's provided to them? Um within the co that context also about uh, if we're standing up in court and making a decision how do you are we able to actually evidence the quality of that data to be able to show the provenance of it the lineage what processes it's gone through um so we need that understanding of how data works flowing throughout the entire of ofcom uh, and what we're doing so that's really key for the work that's done so far but now as the tools are progressing, as the methodologies are changing, it's say, how do we upskill people to continue to learn and continue to develop to understand those future capabilities? That's really great. And you mentioned here at the beginning, you mentioned like um, in one of your answers uh, on the importance of resilience, right? And how no code tools and a lot of different new tooling innovation um, creates, like it, it necessitates the need for resilience within the organization around using these tools and unlocks a lot of the value drivers. Walk us through some of these no code tools that you've employed at Ofcom and how it connects to the data literacy conversation. Yes, I think uh, the simplest ones will be some things like that you, like Power BI, Tableau, some of the dashboarding tools that you'll see. Um, there's obviously technical need, like requirements that are needed for those. Um, I think actually some of the biggest uh, requirements on a dashboard is how to tell a story with data and how to effectively display it. And uh, um, yeah this kind of takes me into Dave McCandle's kind of books and things like the information's <laughs> beautiful it's like that's how I want to see yeah. but um, those kind of low code environments that enable you to be able to more effectively display information so uh, as an example uh, my team supported our Spectrum team at the Commonwealth Games in uh, England so um, when you get a large event you've got a lot of Spectrum uh, radio that's required so uh, teams of broadcasters are talking across to their camera people uh, you've got the director that'll be giving uh, communications there they're also then broadcasting signal back to uh <laughs> to be shared across the world like and each of those different broadcasters if you've got the commonwealth games they've like from every single country will have need their own specific part of the radio spectrum within that uh, geographic area contained so we have people who are then monitoring those uh, spectrum board um, 
ranges that are being used. And my team then helped develop a dashboard to support some of that to understand which radio waves are being used uh, and where there could be interference across the different bands, but then also understanding who's been given licenses to use different bands within that area. And that's the case where you had the low code, no code <laughs> being written into the dashboard, uh, taking very technical information, presenting it back to them people who aren't necessarily data experts, but they are spectrum experts to be able to use that information to be able to make decisions on the fly in real time. I love that example, especially in how it unlocks, you know, subject matter expertise, like being a spectrum expert, right? And with data, you're being able to, you know, improve uh, and make an operation on the day-to-day -day much more efficient. Um, now, one thing that you mentioned as well that we talked about uh, is the importance of, you know, communication and being able to evangelize the importance of upskilling and data literacy within the organization. Walks through as the chief data officer, how have you approached this uh, aspect of change management? And how do you, uh, what do you think are best practices for engaging the organization with data upskilling and data literacy? Yeah, so I think I mentioned that we're in the stages of uh, finalizing our data strategy and actually getting that out to everyone. So there's a, a large part of the comms that goes alongside how we work to get that data strategy out to people. Um, I've, so I've always looked at a comm strategy from a almost like a, I don't know I was obsessed with the West Wings. They're so looking at their messaging grid and how they get political messages out. And it's almost the same thing where we've got we've got channel channels of uh, being able to get information out. We've got certain stories that we're trying to land at different times uh, and try and say how do we reach people within the organisation to be able to share that. So. Let's take go through some of those channels. We've got uh, an internal intranet that we use as a news uh, site. We have uh, Yammer that's then going out. Um, there's a weekly uh, it's, uh, broadcast in Ofcom that goes out to all of the different sites, and uh, that's filmed and shared. Um, and then you have team meetings. And beyond that, we have things like uh, that we're trying to look at, like ideation sessions and hackathons to be able to say, how do we get some of this out? Um, and also trying to say we've got uh, data champions uh, that uh, exist within the entire of, of Ofcom. So in different business areas, people who are part of the data profession, they're part of that wider community, and they'll be able to share information out to their teams. So all of those channels exist, but I think there's also then that messaging piece in terms of what are the key messages that we're trying to get out. So as we, uh, I came aboard, so early days as an introductory message, like this is who I am, this is what my team do, this is uh, the facilities and the capabilities that we can add that can add value into your business areas. Beyond that, there's a part where we're trying to collaboratively develop the data strategy, and I when I came into this, it was from a position where I didn't want that to be a top-down diktat. It's not a, this is the data strategy, you will follow it. I needed that to be a, uh, from that organization, how do we break down the silos and make sure that this, there's one data community and we're working together? So we helped build forums. We're able to pull in some of that information. Uh, there's a lot of surveys and like trying to work with people to tease out some of the knowledge. Uh, and then that culminated in a large workshop where we had uh, over 100 people, I think it was in the end, uh, but from every single business area was represented there, whether data experts or technical experts to say how they use information, how they'd want to use information, uh, what their business uh, problems were and uh, where there's some of the blockages in that. So that whole piece is part of the thing of building a larger community and being able to demonstrate the value that data has. And from that, that's been able to build up some of that internal community. Going forwards, I think it's then a case of some of those ideation sessions. We want to take some of those future technology, some of these more advanced capabilities and talk to people and start saying, well, let's imagine we're 10 years into the future and data's great and everyone can get all the information they want. Now, what do you want to do with it? Uh, you're seeing the examples of large language models of image generation of whatever else it is, uh, video classification. Now, let's try and use some of that uh, new technology that's coming out and what would that mean in your business areas? 
It's amazing. I love the approach to community here. And I love how you've been able as well to, you know, incorporate maybe new advanced technologies as a way to draw a vision, right, of where we could be. Um, what do you think, you know, as a chief data officer here, um, how do you, conf how do you, what is the vision that you're trying to, to, you know, communicate to the wider organization, right? And how do you get people on board with that vision? I know that you mentioned here the importance of community, right? Um, but how do you, what do you think is a message that resonated quite a lot when kind of incorporating new technologies as part of your vision? Yes, I think this, this probably goes back to um, Ofcom's uh, mission statement. So there's obviously how do we make uh, communications work for everyone, but then underneath that there's things around uh, an internet that's safe and reliable, a um, broadcast, and like all of the different areas that I've mentioned before that uh, Ofcom regulates. And I think part of it is understanding, helping people to understand the link from the work that they do to the mission and the vision of Ofcom overall. And that really shouldn't be underestimated. I think in the current environment, uh, we've got a huge shortfall of technical and data people uh, across the world. Um, wages are much higher than a government organization would normally be able to pay. And don't get me wrong, we're definitely trying to keep up with it. But you see some of the wages that are paid by some of the largest tech and data companies. Um, and so we're looking at what our vision is and our value that we offer. And I think part of that is around the uh, value that Ofcom has a, as a whole. And you certainly see that from like the Gen Z who like by 2025, they're going to make up uh, over a quarter of the marketplace and their value that they put into uh, the wider community and uh, how, how, the benefits that uh, a company has uh, in terms of some of the, you know, the what we're doing uh, for the wider society is so much more important than just a what's my pay packet. And so trying to rely on the messaging around how important communication is, how it's a uh, breaks down some of those barriers, how it enables people to live better lives uh, is really important for us. And then some of those value drivers, especially like the online safety is a huge draw where people see some of the uh, dangerous aspects of uh, online, some of the rabbit holes that people can get drawn into. So how do we then start to protect children online? That's a big draw to get people who maybe wouldn't uh, think about working in this space into Ofcom. I, I love that. And, you know, Richard, this connects to my, you know, uh, to my other section that I want to discuss with you here is kind of the specificities and the challenges of working in data and government, right, in the public sector. Uh, you know, in general, I don't envy the CDO's position. There's a lot of change that needs to be managed. It's a heavy burden from managing data infrastructure, technological change, cultural change. However, in a lot of ways, the CDO's role is even more complex in the public sector and government, right? Uh, one of them, for example, you mentioned here is being able to attract talent, right, and being able to, you know, uh, create a vision for attracting talent that is uh, really relevant, which I think you do excellently here. Um, what are some of the uh, key government-specific challenges data leaders can face when executing on a data strategy in the public sector? Yeah, so one, I think one of the biggest challenges that I realized coming into, quite quickly coming into Ofcom compared to uh, where I'd been previously was I'd been able to use pretty much whatever data that I wanted to of, within the realms of uh, GDPR and everything else. But uh, I'd been able to use the techniques and the data and information that I wanted to to be able to make decisions and say, how do we use those? Um, we're constrained by Acts of Parliament. So that we uh, got our powers from uh, Communications Act and then subsequent act, you've got the online safety bill that's coming on now. That will define what is within Ofcom's remit of what we're able to do. We can't just then go and pull any data or request any information unless it's in line with the bill. We also, the information that we request needs to be proportionate and there's a number of different areas. So the Areas that I think is really 
different for me in working in this sector that I haven't experienced before is then say, how do I make sure that I've got that really close tie in with our legal team and the public policy teams to be able to make sure that everything that we do is within the remit of what Ofcom is legally allowed to do. Um, and that, that does create some challenges and probably it goes back to uh, some of the conversations we had about the curiosities that people have that we're employing now have come from academia they've come from smaller enterprises some of the startup tech uh, tech companies and places like that where they've had a lot more freedom um, and so they feel constrained and there's a question now is to say how do we make sure that they're not being seen that there's just barriers that are put in front of them and that someone's saying no to them constantly but saying how do we make sure that we're having those effective communications so it's not just with the business it's also then trying to integrate some of their legal and public policy teams that maybe other places wouldn't have to consider yeah i completely agree and you know i think the flip side of this right and you mentioned uh the importance of communication right is that when we talk about the challenge of managing data in government i think it's also important to recognize the other side of the coin here which is the responsibility government agencies bear when leveraging data right you know ofcom has an extraordinary mission as you laid out of keeping the internet tv and radio safe ensuring consumers get what they're paying for when it comes to telecom services walk us through how data science keeps the internet safer maybe yeah, so the online safety bill is coming online uh, this year um, and Ofcom's been selected as the regulator for that. So what does that mean in terms of the data team? So we have a group uh, within Ofcom that's being set up, the online safety group that's going to manage the codes and the um, policies that will be uh, recommendations of codes that will be going out to public consultation um we also that will then have a supervisory team that will be managing those closer supervision with uh, platforms uh, and enforcement teams so all of those different areas will require different types of data um when it comes to some of those uh examples so just being able to understand the uh remit of uh or the universe, the size of what there uh, is in scope of the bill. So um, I think when we origin when it was originally set up, there was a thought that I think it was 10,000 platforms uh, within the UK would be in scope. As we did some initial an analysis, that kind of increased to around 50,000, I think. And we've recently done some work where we started pulling in information about all of the different web servers and what comes into different categorizations, whether that's a user-to-user -user service, a search service, adult services, uh, to be able to say what could be in scope of the regime. And suddenly we're up to potentially hundreds of thousands of platforms. To be able to then understand what those platforms do, uh, what the features are they have. Is it a user to user? Is it search? Is it an adult service? Um, and then within that, trying to understand if it's an adult service, does it have age recognition on it? So we can uh, help make sure that children aren't accessing adult specific content. Uh, things like that, we can start to look at from a data science point of view. So it's just a trying to pull in that information to be able to understand who the platforms are, what their features are. Some of that information's early doors start of some of the capabilities that we're looking at. Um, beyond that, trying to understand what are the terms, the conditions that the platforms uh, have in place that they're using to, for instance, protect children online. Um, and then on the internal side, I mentioned that we've got um, the... Uh, policy that will be going out to consultation, that's likely to generate a lot of responses. Uh, so there's a huge part of this to be able to say, how do we understand uh, what those responses are? How do they link back to the policies and the code? So if we've got, I don't know, a, hundred, a thousand different responses that come in uh, via email, web form, whatever it is, uh, and they all relate to section 3.4 of the codes. How do we make sure that we can identify that? And that's partly using uh, some natural language processing and trying to work through with that to be able to link individual responses back to the codes to enable those the team to respond to that consultation more effectively.
And, you know, Richard, with this uh, overview of the challenges, but also with the responsibility that a data team and a chief data officer has within a government agency, uh, maybe as we close out, I'd love to learn from you. What would be your advice for a newly appointed chief data officer in government? Have a very clear calendar and speak to as many people as possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it literally that that communication uh, cannot be underestimated to understand what's the value that data can drive, and you can only find that out by having the conversations with people. That is great. And you know, as we close out, Richard, what are some of the exciting innovations maybe that you've been looking out looking out for in this space? You mentioned here the vision of connecting technology to the mission, right? Um, what are some of the technologies that you've been excited about, especially? Yes, I think uh as every other person's looking at some of the capabilities that uh, some of these foundational models will have, so the large language models, but then also for me specifically, some of those multimodal models when you start looking at the impact that you can start to have with video text um, and images and being able to use all of those effectively together, like that's going to have huge impacts on how we look at online safety. But just generally, I think there's that capability to make things faster. So I saw someone today, uh, I saw uh, someone emailed me in a video of someone who'd uh, drawn a website on a napkin and shown that to chat GPT and it had written the code for them. Uh, and I'm just saying, uh, what's what does this mean for our team as we move into the future? And it's kind of replicating what we always did. We'd go into Stack Overflow and take bits, chunks of code and copy them and paste them and kind of go, is this working? And then pull it together. It's kind of doing that, but really, really effectively. So I think it's just going to make us more efficient for the future. Yeah, in a lot of ways as well, I think it will pose a lot of challenges for online moderation. If the cost of creating content goes down to zero, what does that mean for online safety as well? And there's going to be a lot of data science techniques that are needed as well to combat that velocity of content creation down the line. I think, yeah, the risks of algorithms and the algorithmic assurance is definitely something that will be looked at more broadly. Yeah, definitely. So, Richard, as we close out, is there any final call to action you have for listeners before we wrap up today's show? No, I think the, the big thing for me, as mentioned a few times, is keep the communications going and uh, stay curious. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Richard, for coming on with DataFrame. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.